Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This time on Central Texas Gardener, the spotlight's on designs that defy drought. Stephen Orr, author of Tomorrow's Gardens, updates our garden perceptions with sustainable concepts for the future. On tour in San Antonio, visit a no-lawn garden based on outdoor living spaces designed around a green-built house. So let's get growing, right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. And also from The Planket, a plant covering designed to be lightweight, breathable, and water resistant to help keep plants warm and dry during harsh winter weather. Theplanket.com. Gardens that extend living spaces upgrade our sensitivity to their powerful impact on our lives. Here's a new outlook at this no-lawn garden in San Antonio that set the stage for a green-built home. Thank you to Brendan Bigelow for composing the music. In San Antonio's historic King William District, Gary Woods built a new home to blend in with the neighboring ones dating from 1910. His new garden actually takes a cue from 1910 as well, since he stops watering plants once they're established. This was actually a parking lot for the electric company. It wasn't paved, but uh, trucks would park here and it was all compacted soil and it was just a, it had been a vacant lot since 1946. The only thing on it was a pecan tree. Gary restored it and the compacted soil while the house was in its design stage. I got 75 yards of mulch and rented a bobcat, and, which was a blast, and then spread the mulch all across the lot and it sat there for four or five years until the actual breaking the ground and stuff, and all that decayed, and so now it's rich, rich black soil. Architect Stephen Colley built his green designs around outdoor living rooms. One houses the living room and kitchen. The other is the bedroom and bathroom. It's kind of like the idea of a, of a Mexican home where there's a central courtyard, uh, except it's done in the style of this, this bungalow style of house. But the idea of really the, the garden and the courtyards were, were built, were designed and the house had to fit with the, around that. So the, the garden took priority over the house in a way. From inception, Collie worked with garden designer Elizabeth McGreevy. The first main objective was obviously was to connect the two parts of the houses. You had the kitchen and living over here, you had the bedroom and bathroom over here. And to have this breezeway, almost like a dog trot style, but it's all open. But, you know, we wanted to make this outdoor pergola really large, structural. So it really is part of the house and not just an add-on. We made it massive and it is going to eventually have uh, wisteria vines covering it to add like a ceiling of sorts and to cool the breezes. From the main entrance gate, the viewpoint ended on their neighbor's windows. McGreevy designed a trellis to alter the perspective. It's not that we had to completely block the house, you just want to direct the eye down. So that that becomes your focus, not the neighbor's house. And I also want to give the sense of more spaciousness, of creating a sight line so it feels larger. I mean, this is a small lot, but I create a lot of sight lines to give the feeling of spaciousness. McGreevy's idea of a red bench completes the visual redirection and connects to the breezeway's red chairs. Another pergola unifies the breezeway spot from the kitchen to the outdoor dining room off the interior living room. It's like there's indoor and outdoor rooms and they all have a relationship to each other. So if you're standing in the living room, there's a patio next to it that has a, about the same size. It's the adjacent room. And here in this patio, it's adjacent to the kitchen. And so it makes every room seem bigger and connected. It's kind of like walking through a house with a series of rooms, except it's indoor and outdoor rooms mixed together. So I make I can even stand in my bathroom and look out into the patio from my from my while I'm brushing my teeth in the morning. The pergolas, along with strategically placed trees, capture the southeast breeze off the nearby San Antonio River for outdoor air conditioning. They even directed the airflow with a gap in the front yard fence. It's small, but that's large enough to kind of help funnel and draw the wind that way. So every single thing has a purpose. There's nothing random about this design. 
Elizabeth layered plants for structure, wildlife attention, and low care in a no-lawn garden. First of all, I'm very lazy, and I don't like to have to work that hard. I don't have any lawn mower. I don't even have a weed whacker. So I really wanted something that was low maintenance. And also, I just didn't want to spend the money on water. Uh, my water bill generally is under $30 a month. I mean, just for one person. Uh, but it's $30 a month, and, uh, and so that, that's part of it. But part of it for me, a lawn is just wasted space. I mean, I'm not playing sports, so I, I, I just want, I want those spaces in my yard to actually be rooms that I can use and enjoy. The rooms continue around the house for different encounters. On this corner lot, one wide view from the street favors Southwest Texas scrub plants. On the other street side, it's reminiscent of 1910. But step inside the interior courtyard for a new look at things. The garden success in dry and wet times started with soil restoration and the right plant for each site. The plant is not happy, it's going to become high maintenance. The summer of 2011, we had temperatures in excess of 100 degrees. And while everyone's yards were dying everywhere, everyone, their grasses were dying, you know, the trees are turning brown. But in Gary's yard, with no supplemental irrigation, and he only watered the things he had planted in the last few months, everything he had, start, uh, had planted, three, you know, that's already established three or four years ago, no water whatsoever, no water. You know, we got to be more, selective and diligent about getting plants in the right place and restoring our soil. It's important, it's imperative, you know, to really try to reduce water consumption in, in our landscapes. It's like right now, what, 30% of our water use? And uh, I talk to people all the time who are watering every two days. And, you know, we need to get it down to where it's typical every two weeks if you really want a lush landscape. But we need to get past these ideas of it being overly lush, blooming all the time. Yards that say green all the time. You know, be willing to change with the seasons. Connection to the seasons through companionship of spaces was Gary's vision from the start. It's really worth having your house, the inside of your house connect with the outside of your house. That you don't want to be sealed up in your house or outside on the lawn. You want to have, you want the the division between the two houses to open up. You, you find you find yourself outside much more often, just for little daily things. You just come outside and have a cup of coffee in the morning when you're getting ready to go to work in five minutes. But it's no big deal because it's just part of your living space. You know, it's not a special thing, it's just a daily thing. Thanks so much for sharing that beautiful garden space with us. And right now we're very excited to welcome Stephen Orr to Central Texas hey, Gardener. Tom, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Welcome to the program. It's nice to be here. Stephen is the author of Tomorrow's Garden, which will be the subject of our, our conversation. Um, but also, uh, he is the garden editor for Martha Stewart Living. So, um, That's right. busy man. Uh, yeah. With your fingers in uh, every corner of American gardening, so you really get to see this kind of emerging American garden style, don't you? I, I, we do. I'm trying to show uh, a nationwide approach to gardening, which is really hard, as you know, because mm -hmm. every space is so different. Every right. region is so different. Mm -hmm. And so that's always been a challenge. Um, I've worked at several different magazines, and all of them have been nation, nationwide magazines. So right. it's hard to show. You want to show a regional, a regional approach, but also extract lessons that mm -hmm. everyone can enjoy around the country. Right, right. Well, as I indicated, I think I, th I really do believe that America is developing its own kind of garden aesthetic now. Uh, and Austin is in the a leading uh, company, really. I there would, are a lot I of would definitely here. say so, because I, um, you know, I've traveled all over. In this, at, at, at Martha Stewart Living, we basically do um, dom we do domestic gardens, mm. meaning we do gardens in the U.S. Sure. Um, but I used to be at House and Garden magazine. Mm -hmm. a, a beautiful Beautiful magazine. Doesn't exist right. anymore. Sadly. But um, I would go to other countries. But mm -hmm. So I would go all over the place looking for gardens. And, and I have to say, in the past uh, 10 or 15 years, I really started to see, in Austin particularly, this new style of gardening that I think was a kind of a meld of 
West Coast styles of gardening mixed with the Southwest, mm -hmm. mixed with a little bit of the South as far as plant material goes. Right. And that's one thing I, I like about Austin is it is kind of a mixture of all these different, mm -hmm. it's kind of where the South meets the West meets exactly. the Plains. Right. Well, you, you get all these different uh, influences. Mm -hmm. Culturally as well as botanically. Yes. We are, and we Mexico. Sit, and right. And, no, let's not forget. So you get all of that exciting stuff and mm -hmm. so you get, uh, I think you get a really nice melting pot of right. styles. Now one of the threads that unites this kind of emerging style is sustainability, right? Yes. And that's, your book is really focused on uh, tomorrow's garden is really about the garden that we we can have in the future, and and uh, but it's not just utilitarian in that sense because no. it really celebrates the possibilities within that framework of sustainability. It it does. Tomorrow's garden to me means just looking forward instead of looking back, mm -hmm. and not gardening on a kind of a 19th century mode or even a 20th century mm -hmm. mode where we're looking at um, a kind of a grandmother's idea of a garden. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that because sure. many of us grew up being affected by maybe our oh, parents, yeah. our parents or our grandparents' <laughs> gardens, but they didn't have to think about some of the same things we do as far mm. as um, resources right. and also, um, res and when I, when I say resources, I mean we don't want to waste time mm -hmm. as far as water. Right. We don't want to waste um, money. We don't want to waste our own time and effort because mm. many, most of us work busy right. jobs. So we want to have gardens that can sustain themselves a little bit more easily than perhaps they sure. might have 50 or 100 years ago. And of course here in Austin and throughout the state of Texas that with uh, the last year's intense drought yes. uh, weighing on our minds as we approach summer, uh, this is something we've got to think about. It, it's, it's, it's terrible and I have felt, you know, with the drought that you've been through, up in the Northeast, I live in New York City, and we've had so much rain, we've had too much rain. And so whenever I would complain to my friends in, in Austin, um, where I, I did go to school mm -hmm. here in Austin, I would uh, feel so guilty because I was complaining about too much rain and how mm -hmm. plants were being drowned and right. we were having trouble with mildew and molds. Mm -hmm. And you guys were starving. So it's like I just wanted to carve a channel and send you <laughs> all the we water. We will accept, <laughs> gladly accept some of that. Because it just, some, I felt like, you know, it never stopped raining at some point. Right. And that's the opposite of what you had. So that just shows you that we have, in this big country, we mm -hmm. have all of these disparate mm -hmm. concerns that you never know right. what's going to happen from year to year. Well, and uh, that's a happy problem. At least it sounds like a happy problem for us right now. But let's let's pick out some of those different things uh, that are kind of the the cues to the sustainability you're you're, th you're talking about here. Um, one of the things is about the way that we organize the garden spaces themselves. Yes. And you're a big advocate and you have a lovely section of the book that talks about garden rooms. This makes a whole lot of sense. How does that help make a garden sustainable? I think it just makes you use the garden space. You know, mm -hmm. we all pay for the space, whether you rent or you buy, mm -hmm. you're paying for that outdoor space. Right. So I think when I grew up in, in Texas, early in my life, I grew up in Abilene, we did garden in the back, but as I got a little older and maybe got into junior high, we didn't really go in the backyard very much at all. And that I think that's kind of, in the old style, was kind of a Texas thing where you just kind of, there was the backyard and it had a lawn and it had a perimeter of beds, <laughs> right. and you just kind of looked at it and you didn't use it that much. It's still the norm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think I'm trying to encourage people all over right. the country, even if you live in an area where it's either cold in the winter or mm -hmm. hot in the summer, to think of ways to divide the space up and have each area have a different usage, whether it's a place right. for uh, a dinner, mm -hmm. a place to read a book, a place to play with your kids or your dog, and have each area be really meaningful so that even in a small yard, you're, di you're dividing it up into spaces that are usable. And you're blurring that, that boundary line between indoors and out yes. and, and creating more living space. In and architects and even landscape architects, they call that the program. Mm -hmm. So it's, they, they think in a programmatic way about the backyard or the space, what is each area doing? You know, right. it's, not just a, it's not just an area that's just, well, and then we mm -hmm. have that. You know, each thing has a different area. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the lawn. Yes. And that's an issue that has been on the forefront of our minds now for the past couple of years here regionally. Yeah. In fact, on my garden radio program, number one call in question, far exceeding anything else is, I've had it with taking care of lawn. What else can I do? Yes. And this is something you address as well. Well, I, I, I hate to tell people not to have lawns, especially mm -hmm. in areas like up in the Northeast, we don't have to worry about water right now. But five or 10 years ago, I do remember a big drought mm -hmm. that we did have there. 
and all the grass was dying, all, you know, or, or going dormant. Mm -hmm. So for most of us, um, lawns have a kind of a historic, you know, we kind of identify with them from childhood, or maybe we want to have a lawn, to, as I said, a place to play with the dog or with the sure. kids. So I, I hate to say, tell people to have no lawn, but I t try to tell them to think of it as an emphatic lawn, like a lawn that they mean it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I they like can, that. <laughs> they can get rid of their lawn entirely and replace it with gravel or mm -hmm. crushed stone, mm -hmm. like decomposed granite or whatever. Great material for us here in Central Texas. Or you could just have a square of lawn mm -hmm. that is functions more as, like a, I, I say in the book, thinking of your lawn more as a, as a rug or a series of rugs mm -hmm. instead of wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Right. Because historically, that's what we've always done is just made flower beds and then fill in the rest with lawn. Right. And um, and I think we're go that's kind of no matter where you live, that's kind of a mm -hmm. an old-fashioned way to think about it. Um, sure. Because we don't really have a culture, we don't have an English climate that can sustain that sort of green mm -hmm. lawn that we're trying to hang on to from mm -hmm. the old days. And the alternatives really are so appealing in a lot of so ways. So many more alternatives. Yeah. yeah. As far as drought-tolerant grasses, mm -hmm. or, or as I said, gravel. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of that Austin aesthetic we were talking about is yeah. kind of the spare aesthetic use of a lot of hardscape or, or gravel interspersed with these uh, either very structural or very free-flowing kinds of plants. Kind of uh, garden sculpture, plants as garden sculpture. Mm -hmm. So you can have agaves or you can have native shrubs mixed mm -hmm. with low-growing matted um, mm -hmm. mats of, of, of herbs mm -hmm. or a native ground cover. And you can do so much, and it can be so mm -hmm. distinctive looking, mm -hmm. but at the same time, not high maintenance. Right, yeah. right. And you also include, I have to say, the, on the other end of the extreme, some rather exuberant spaces that are planted to the nines, really. Yes. But uh, that too can be sustainable if, you, if it just the depends plants are chosen. On the, it plends on the gar depends on the gardener mm -hmm. and what their emphasis is. I didn't want to, at first when I was doing the book, and I, I went around and took a, the photos myself in about 12 mm -hmm. different locations around mm -hmm. the country. Um, and while I was doing that, I realized I was really focusing on one kind of look, mm -hmm. which is kind of the look we're talking about with the spare right. spaces and the mm -hmm. sculptural plants. And that's what I was a, a drawn, drawn to first. We, mm -hmm. we might call it modern looking. Right. And I realized I didn't want to leave out people who like a lot of flowers. Sure. And I didn't want to leave out people who wanted a more traditional feeling. Mm -hmm. So I went back and found other things, but tried to make it clear that those spaces are for people who want to devote the effort mm -hmm. and the resource to doing it. All right. And many people don't. Go in with your eyes open, in other words. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's for the avid gardener. I never want to say, oh, you have to get rid of your intensive flower bed. Mm -hmm. that takes a lot of manipulation. And right time because some people love that that's what mm -hmm. it's like needlework or whatever they love to get out there and always adjust right the right. plantings and that's the kind of garden I actually like myself right. very briefly yeah. uh, we're running out of time but uh, w next project in mind well they I'm trying to do another book I don't have the theme completely formed yet okay but but uh, you know some idea of sustainability and something mm. where people can I, I always want to write a book that's useful for people right and not a book that's just merely decorative mm -hmm. for the coffee table All right Right. Well, we'll look forward to that, and okay, congratulations you, on tomorrow's garden. Thank you so much for being on Central thank Texas you. Gardener. Coming up next, it's our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards, and this is Augie. Our question this week is, what kind of soil do I have, and why does it make a difference? Well, your soil can make all the difference in the world to what you're planting, especially if you're a farmer or a would-be farmer but even if you're just looking to put in a simple home landscape. A tree that does perfectly fine in East Austin may croak almost overnight in West Austin. So knowing your soil is indeed very important. You can learn a little bit just by digging a hole. You may not be able to get the shovel into the ground at all, meaning you may have heavy clay or rock, or you may be able to dig a three foot hole with ease. I know you've heard of having your soil tested through the Texas AgriLife Extension Service, which will give you great information about the nutrients in your soil. But soil texture is also important. You used to have to go to the library or your county extension office and look at soil survey maps in order to find out about your soil. But recently, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service uploaded all of their soil mapping data to their website. So now you can go to the site and get an entire soil survey built just for the area that you define. Although the website's a bit cumbersome if you're not a systems analyst geek, 
It's very powerful and very useful, especially if you're looking to purchase a piece of land and start a vineyard or an orchard or some other business venture. If you can't remember the link, just Google Web Soil Survey and the NRCS site will come up. Our pick of the week is Barbados Cherry, Malpighia glabra. This native plant is great as an accent shrub or screen. Like most plants, it needs a little extra water during the first year or so, but it's very drought tolerant once established. There are dwarf varieties available, but common Barbados cherry usually gets four to six feet tall and has a spreading habit, so give it plenty of room to grow. The small flowers, which bloom in spurts from April through October, look very similar to the flowers of crepe myrtle. Barbados cherry produces a lovely bright red fruit that's edible and high in vitamin C, but quite tart. This plant performs well in part shade to full sun and is evergreen during most winters. In a harsh winter, it might lose its leaves but will bounce back when spring arrives. It's adaptable to most soils but does require good drainage. The delicate mauve pink flowers attract butterflies and hummingbirds, but its bright red fruit is a truly wonderful food source for the birds during the hot months of summer. Those fruits and the tender leaves may also attract other wildlife to your yard and deer absolutely love them. It does have a rather thicket-like growth habit, so unless you have a true wildscape, you may want to prune Barbados cherry to keep it in shape and looking less messy. To do in your garden this week, it's time to side dress those vegetables with a little compost or fertilizer to perk them up a bit. Keep your fruit trees well watered. Watering them this year will ensure a good fruit crop next year. Be sure also to water your new trees and shrubs that you might have planted this spring, and also your perennials. Until they're established, they need a good, deep watering once a week. Stick your finger in the soil to make sure that you're getting water down to a depth of at least six inches. That water will then percolate down to about 12 inches. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions or plants of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. Hi, I'm Trisha Shari, and this is Backyard Basics. It's today we're here in my backyard at Lake Austin Spa Resort. And uh, there comes a time when all gardeners need to give their plants a little extra nutrition. And one of the ways I like to do that that's very inexpensive is to make your own fertilizer by making a compost tea or a nutrient tea. And it's pretty simple. Just take a good quality manure compost, put it in a bucket, a five gallon bucket, and cover it with water, preferably rainwater or a water that doesn't have chlorine. And then you can just stir it a couple of times a day to in introduce uh, air into it. You could also do the same thing with earthworm castings and make an excellent fertilizer that way too. You can also add coffee grounds, tea grounds to that same mix and give your plants the nutrients from those because coffee grounds are high in uh, nitrogen so that's a great good drink for your plants. Now I let it sit for a day or two and then the compost will settle to the bottom so I strain the, t the liquid off the top, dilute it and then put just a little bit around the base of each plant. Now here's another way you could do this to make it a little easier to use use an old pillowcase and put your compost in the pillowcase and then just tie that up and tie it to the handle of the bucket and then that way it acts like a giant tea bag you could pull that out and not have to worry about straining that before you put it in the garden now this is not true aerobic compost tea, so this is not something I would put directly on the foliage of the plants. This is more as a root fertilizer, so I put it toward the base of the plant. Now I have my plants mulched with compost and then a shredded hardwood mulch, so as you're putting that nutrient on the plant, Sometimes it's hard to get that right down through the mulch. So I bury pots in the ground, smaller pots like a one quart pot for the uh, smaller plants or a gallon pot for larger plants like tomatoes. And you can put one pot between two plants or even three plants. And uh, as long as it's with between 12 to 18 inches from the root zone of the plant, that fertilizer is going to leach out into the root zone of the plant. And it's interesting when I've pulled these pots up and the plants up after after the uh, garden season is over, I see lots of roots just really around those pots where
where they've been uh, going for the nutrients. You can use those same pots for putting kelp meal, cottonseed meal, Epsom salts, just giving your plants a little bit of extra nutrition in the pots and then put a water hose in and give the plants a drench of uh, good fertilizer. Add things like fish emulsion, Super Thrive, uh, any of those kinds of extra nutrients to the compost tea and you can really give your plants a balanced and uh, healthy drink. Now this fertilizing can be done as often as the plants really look like they need a push and I tend to use this about every two weeks when plants are just getting started and maybe once a month as plants become more established in the garden. It works very well. And then once you finish with that compost you can usually rebrew it a second time and then that compost can just go around the base of your plants, add it to your compost pile and uh, so it's not wasted but you've gotten a lot of mileage out of that shovel full of compost. Post. This is a great way to uh, feed your plants. For Backyard Basics, I'm Trisha Shari. Thanks for joining us. Watch online and find out more at klru.org ctg. Next week, get ideas for stylish plants that take the heat. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. And also from The Planket, a plant covering designed to be lightweight, breathable, and water resistant to help keep plants warm and dry during harsh winter weather. Theplanket.com.